Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is Dave Evelyn, the president of Sunwise Power and Battery. Uh, originally, Rob Rollo was going to present, but I had the opportunity to present today, and I'm excited about the topic. So I, uh, I'm going to present this one. Rob is actually on the webinar as well. So Tom uh, Westrich, uh, chief engineer from USSI, and myself will present today. So this is uh, the overview of the presentation. Uh, we're going to jump right in and we're going to review some case studies. Uh, then we'll go ahead and introduce Sunwise and USSI and speak more specifically to why add a fuel cell to your, your power system. And we'll have another case study. And then we'll do a little bit more detail on an intro to fuel cells and conclude with a case study. So we're going to use the case studies to um, just really emphasize the reasons why a fuel cell can add value to your power system to your for your remote application. Just speaking quickly, a fuel cell converts chemical energy from a fuel, a hydrocarbon fuel, into electricity through an electrochemical reaction. Uh, it's not a combustion engine, uh, it's electrochemical reaction. And a hydrogen reformer takes uh, extracts hydrogen from a, hydro a hydrocarbon fuel, typically methanol, natural gas, gasoline, propane, etc. Uh, some advantages to fuel cells: they can operate in standby mode for months or years without any issues or problems, or the need to cycle them. They're relatively small and compact and easily moved. So they're portable for short-term use at a site. They power equipment with a highly variable load. Um, sometimes with solar, it's a challenge. You need to define your load in advance, uh, whereas with the fuel cell, the variability will not be as critical. Um, many of them use propane, which is stable over time. When paired with batteries, uh, they make a very robust and redundant backup solution. They're quiet and pollution-free, and cost-effective baseload power um, when put in hybrid with a PV or solar electric solution in low sun areas. We're going to talk about a case study here, um, a system 80 watt, 24 volt load in Alaska. Uh, that's very challenging for solar, where the solar insulation is negligible in the winter and the climate is extremely cold and harsh on batteries. So this particular site is Delta Junction, Alaska. Uh, you can see you have sub-zero uh, solar resource, or, or zero solar resource and sub-zero temperatures in the winter. So this would require a very, very large battery bank or, uh, or a spinning generator or something to be a standalone solar system be very, very challenging to accomplish with just solar, very, very expensive. Um, and it's a tough environment for intermittent operation of a rotating generator due to the cold. So you can see a negative 20 degrees C temp and a 0.6 kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour per meter squared solar insulation in January. Uh, I was zero in December. So really impossible to run through the winter on solar alone. So in this load, we have a hybrid with solar. So we have a 1.9 kilowatt solar array coupled with, in this example, a USSI P250i 250 watt fuel cell. And we have a uh, basically 800 amp hour battery at a 72 hour rate. They, with this system, the solar would contribute annually 76% of the energy and the fuel cell would contribute about 24% of the energy. And if we look more specifically at this slide, the fuel cell is shut down essentially from March through September or, or March through August. And the fuel cell starts up in September and uh, runs from September to January, or just September to February, contributing 100% of the energy in December. 
So this is a nice combination of PV and the fuel cell where the PV powers the load in the summer and preserves the fuel and the fuel cell life and the fuel cell carries the load in the winter. So for standalone PV system to function in this application, it would require a 60 to 90 day battery and that's without compensating for temperature derate. And that would just be a, a very, very expensive battery bank and very, very challenging to maintain. Alternate sources, such as a spinning generator, a piston engine would require greater maintenance, higher fuel consumption, exercise cycles, accessories such as block heaters, which also consume energy, and be, create other challenges. So the fuel cell hybrid is a, is a great, uh, uh, great system for this application. Quick background on Sunwise Power and Battery. We have over 20 years of off-grid power system design and manufacturing experience. We've done a lot of work in solar, but we've also done a lot of work in backup power systems, hybrid power systems, et cetera. And we have a pretty strong online sizing and ordering platform. In addition to our standard uh, sales engineering support, et cetera. We have systems working worldwide, um, both solar systems and UPS systems and fuel cell hybrid systems and generator hybrid systems. Here's a, just a listing of the types of systems that we produce. And in a nutshell, we design, manufacture, and sell equipment to generate power, store energy, and distribute electric power at our customer's remote sites, typically for important equipment. So standalone solar, wind solar, fuel cell solar, genset solar, utility backup, just about any uh, system for generating or converting power and delivering energy to uh, electrical load at a remote site. Here's some of the industries that we work in, oil and gas, telecom, security and transportation, uh, many others as well, environmental monitoring, um, all sorts of industries where electrical loads exist at remote locations. We have uh, several locations throughout the U.S. We warehouse and manufacture in New York State and in Oregon. And we have engineering in Oregon. And then we have sales spread throughout the country. And we also have engineering in Maryland. I'm going to hand it over to Tom with USSI. And he'll introduce USSI and go into additional case studies. Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, so my name is Tom Westrich. Um, I'll present just uh, very briefly about our company, and then I'll get into a little bit more specifics about exactly what we do. So Ultra Electronics is a UK-based holdings company. Um, it's got uh, uh, interest in companies that work in defense and aerospace, uh, cyber and security, transport, and energy sectors. Um, if you go on to the next slide, we've got about uh, 20 or so companies uh, currently, one of those companies under that umbrella is Undersea Sensor Systems, or USSI. Uh, we're based in Columbia City, Indiana. That's where our main plant is, uh, and we do a lot of work with uh, uh, electroacoustics, uh, audio products, and then fuel cells. So if you go to the next slide, uh, the fuel cell arm of the business is actually located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we were founded in 99 uh, from some technology spin out out of the University of Michigan. Our core competency is generating uh, systems that produce 50 to 500 watts of power from propane or natural gas for things like extended range UAVs and UGVs uh, for portable power for soldiers or to provide stationary uh, backup power for AC or off-grid remote power systems. Uh, so this is actually a great time for us to introduce a poll question to see how many of you have worked with a fuel cell before. So if you could just fill that in, we'll wait a minute and uh, collect the answers in, in here in a second. All right, so it looks like a few of you have worked with fuel cells before, but the majority of us have not. So 
Uh, what we're going to do now, probably, uh, is to talk a little bit about uh, why you would add a fuel cell to your system, uh, to your power system, and then we'll also go into a little bit more detail about how a fuel cell really works and what you do to integrate that fuel cell to your to your power system. Uh, so as Dave had talked about previously, some of the reasons to add a fuel cell to your solar system, and SOFC is just an acronym for uh, solid oxide fuel cell. Um, maybe you have a variable load. Uh, you probably have insufficient sunlight at your facility and you're already using PV. Uh, fuel cells provide uh, an extra layer of redundancy and reliability as a backup power source. Uh, and they can also be very portable. Uh, some fuel cell systems are very small. Ours is about uh, 20 pounds and is about the size of a CPU desktop. Some can be fairly large and immobile. So it kind of depends on what size you're talking about. Uh, they're also great for remote locations, um, primarily because these types of fuel cells don't require a lot of maintenance. So it makes it a lot easier for the user to install and only go out for fuel uh, changes and fuel fills rather than um, filter changes or, or other unexpected events. Um, one of the other reasons to add a fuel cell to your power system is to help maximize battery life. Uh, so that you don't end up depleting your batteries in say low solar conditions. Next slide. So why would you not use an alternate power source in some of these conditions? Typically, when, I, when we talk about um, alternate energy systems to uh, PV, you think of uh, wind, um, traditional generators or thermal electric generators. There's some reasons here why you wouldn't want to maybe use some of those. Wind, it's fairly inconsistent. Um, you need a fairly high profile. Generators are fairly noisy. They also require a lot of maintenance, uh, maintenance over a few hundred hours. Uh, and you also have some exercise cycles and also some fuel maintenance to try and maintain. Thermal electric generators are uh, a reasonable option. Um, they're fairly inexpensive, however, they're really inefficient, which means that if you're in a remote site that makes it very difficult to deliver fuel to that particular location, uh, you wanna make sure that you have a very efficient device generating power so that you have to go up there much less often than you typically would. Uh, you could also use a different kind of fuel cell, not a solid oxide, but potentially a PEM fuel cell. And we'll talk about PEM fuel cells uh, here in a little bit and some of the advantages and disadvantages. We list PEM because PEM uh, is one of the um, uh, more uh, widely utilized fuel cell systems out there. PEMS and SOFCs are sort of the, the, the bigger fuel cell uh, types in the industry. Next slide. So this is uh, one of the case studies that David mentioned. Um, this uh, is an example application that USSI is um, very involved with, um, where we install one of our systems, and you can see it in that uh, bungalow mounted cabinet there, um, installed at uh, a rail intersection uh, location. So this is an intersection potentially with uh, uh, between the rail line, a track, and and a, and a road where you would need signals or, or gate crossing arms. Our fuel cell is housed in this container uh, with two 20-pound propane tanks underneath it. Uh, and what this does is to connect directly to the batteries that are already located inside of this bungalow. And that system bolted onto the existing system um, is a very low maintenance, uh, reliable source of backup power for that particular installation uh, with the end goal of being able to effectively harden that particular installation against any kind of um, unexpected phenomena, uh, such as weather phenomena knocking out PV, uh, the weather phenomena knocking out AC power, or other human-related activity that could disrupt power to the site. So it's separate from the rest of the system. It's something that can be bolted on to the existing battery uh, power system, uh, battery PV power system to result in this hybrid power system. Uh, our system or fuel cell, solid oxide fuel cells in general uh, can be in standby, standby mode for a very, very long period of time because the internal components, the working components of a solid oxide fuel cell system are ceramics, which don't degrade naturally uh, in those kind of environments. Um, the system monitors battery voltage, acts as a battery tender, and automatically starts and stops only as the battery voltages require. Additionally, propane is a very useful fuel for us because almost everybody has uh, touched 
propane before in terms of being able to um, uh, bring propane to their barbecue grill. So everybody's very, very familiar with it and you can find it virtually anywhere. It's also a uh, very stable fuel, which means that propane can sit in a tank for years on end without having any kind of degradation like you would expect to see with uh, other liquid hydrocarbons. Uh, this particular system only uses about a quarter uh, pounds of uh, propane per hour, which means that if you had uh, one sort of 20 pound standard barbecue tank, that's about 80 hours of operation, and two of them is about 140 to 130 to 160 hours of operation. What that gives you is the ability for maintainers or users of that particular site to be able to schedule maintenance to visit the site refill fuel uh, or fix whatever problem resulted in the fuel cell turning on in the first place. So it's very, very useful from that perspective. Um, go to the next slide. This is an example of what our battery bank voltage looks like over time for an actual rail installation in Ohio. So what you see here are uh, charging and, and, uh, and discharging cycles for one particular battery bank. Uh, you can see, you kind of squint your eyes, the battery voltage starting low, uh, fuel cell turns on, charges the battery, goes through a constant power charge, turns off, and then the battery is deplete with normal, with normal wear. If we go to the next slide, we can zoom in on one of those and we get a better picture. So here, blue is the battery bank, red is the fuel cell output power, this is typically what we see for our types of fuel cells, for solid oxide fuel cells, especially our fuel cell. Uh, you've got a small window where the fuel cell starts up and consumes some battery bank power, some battery energy. Uh, then the fuel cell transitions to a constant power mode. Uh, and at the last 10% uh, or so of this charge cycle, uh, we flip over to a constant voltage charge uh, and then we turn off and the battery can continue to run. What you see in all these little dips are actual uh, uh, events where a train goes through the crossing. So each one of those is a very large load on the battery bank. And this is this is uh, how we're able to state that we can handle fairly large uh, load variations. Um, yeah, there we go, individual trains. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so now we'll transition back out to some of the history and how it feels so really works just to provide some of the audience with a little bit more context um, for how we got to where we are. So fuel cells are uh, uh, fairly old. Um, they've been around since the early 19th century. I think that they were actually around since uh, a little bit before batteries were invented or at least discovered. Um, they're extensively used in NASA's space program. Um, recently, there's been a lot of interest in automotive applications. Uh, and there's been increasing interest in microgrid or distributed power generation uh, or backup power for, for, for various installations, as well as a lot of interest in specifically Japan and Europe for uh, home power and constant uh, CHP type applications where you provide both power and hot water uh, for your house. Next slide. So this is just a, a visual description of a lot of the same information. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so I'd advise you all to feel free to look at this again and uh, uh, review this information if you wanted to really kind of figure out more about the timeline. Next slide. So as Dave pointed out, a fuel cell is an electrochemical device. And electrochemical devices like this, solid state, they don't need really any moving parts. What a fuel cell consists of, and this is one, one cell in a fuel cell, is an anode, an electrolyte, and a cathode. Um, an electrolyte is a dense layer, effectively, that keeps hydrogen from mixing with oxygen. The only thing it allows to transport across it are ions. And throughout this process, uh, you can have electrons, which you strip away from your fuel source and pass through a load uh, or dump into your batteries to help charge the batteries. And that's how you actually do the end electrochemical work. So if we go to the next slide, you see a table of various types of fuel cells here in terms of the columns. So you've got the proton exchange membrane or PEM fuel cells all the way up to solid oxide fuel cells on the other end. Um, as I mentioned, solid oxide fuel cells, if you look at this top row, electrolyte solid oxide fuel cells are ceramic based, but there are some fuel cells that are uh, molten carbonates, so they're sort of a, a, a more liquidy 
uh, electrolyte or a polymer membrane, um, which is uh, effectively just a polymer sponge that's filled with an electrolyte. Um, one of the interesting things that I should probably point out are temperature, the next column. Um, the PEM fuel cells operate at fairly low temperatures, about 0 to 100 degrees Celsius, and solid oxide fuel cells operate anywhere between about 700 and 1,000 or 1,100 degrees Celsius. Um, if we scroll down to being fuel flexible, uh, the PEM fuel cell is not very flexible in terms of fuel. They typically only use hydrogen, and it's got to be very high purity hydrogen. Solid oxide fuel cells, because of their high temperature, can use a wide variety of fuels, a uh, wide variety of hydrocarbon fuels or hydrogen. Um, and then if we kind of go down, uh, startup time is another interesting um, uh, Another interesting aspect to each of these fuel cells, PEM fuel cells typically start up very quickly because they don't need to reach high temperatures. But solid oxide fuel cells uh, can start up uh, anywhere in the order of minutes to hours or days. Uh, they need to get to very high temperatures, so you have to ha allow for some time for the fuel cell to actually warm up uh, in order to come to an operational temperature. So that's why in our uh, rail case study, you saw some brief window at the beginning and at the end of the charge cycle where the fuel cell was actually consuming a little bit of battery power in order to uh, increase its temperature in order to cool back down again. So next slide. So a PEM fuel cell, as I said, uses high purity hydrogen as a fuel. It also requires a catalyst, a platinum group metal, um, to facilitate this electrochemical reaction. Now you use this catalyst to separate hydrogen, the hydrogen molecule into hydrogen atoms. Um, purifying hydrogen is uh, something that requires external reforming. And reforming is that process by which you separate a hydrocarbon into hydrogen. What you typically see done industrially is uh, using natural gas for this process. And natural gas has stuff like carbon in it. When you do reforming of natural gas, you will form carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And you will also see sulfur. Sulfur, carbon monoxide will poison the catalyst that's used in PEM fuel cells. Uh, so it's very, very important that your reforming technique is uh, producing very high purity hydrogen. Next slide, thank you. Uh, so some of these systems can also use sort of other, uh, other fuel feedstocks instead of natural gas, something like methanol to extract hydrogen. Um, what's Interesting with some of these with these concepts is that when you're dealing with uh, portable or remote applications where you don't want to deliver high purity hydrogen to the particular site, uh, you're going to have to carry your reformer with you. So reformers in general, in order to achieve high purities and last for a very long uh, period of time before any kind of required maintenance, are typically very very big on the order of the size of the fuel cell system or several times larger. Um, so that's a very interesting point to mention. Um, PEM fuel cells are uh, are very um, widely used occasionally. They're not necessarily used continuously. A lot of the continuous use fuel cells are typically uh, solid oxide fuel cells. Uh, and then going back to uh, some of these specific requirements for PEM fuel cells, um, they they are very useful in some applications, but for the for for the most uh, most applications for remote uh, installations, a lot of the uh, uh, advantages are typically offset by some of these special needs in terms of fuel delivery or site requirements or heating uh, of the of the PEM fuel cell itself. So if we go to the next slide, uh, fuel solid oxide fuel cells, uh, the high temperature variety, uh, because they operate at very high temperatures, they don't need catalysts like platinum. They use very inexpensive catalysts like nickel. Um, there's no external reformer required for operation. Because we're at such high temperatures, we can easily do all of the hydrogen extraction necessary to operate. Uh, the technology has been around for a very long time and has a very large demonstrated life. And it's very efficient at both large and small scales. Um, because we use uh, nickel as as our catalyst, as a, instead of instead of things like platinum, uh, and because we're using ceramics, a lot of our feedstocks are fairly low cost. Um, and again, these are some repeated bullet points in terms of being able to use uh, 
uh, avoid the use of platinum and also being able to use a wide variety of fuel stocks such as natural gas, propane, uh, and other potentially liquid fuel feedstocks as well. So earlier in the table of different types of fuel cells, uh, there was one little note at the very bottom that said that there were planar fuel cells and tubular fuel cells, um, uh, solid oxide fuel cells specifically. Because these are ceramics, you can either make uh, a plate that has a layer of anode electrolyte cathode, uh, or you can make a tube, which if you look at it radially, has the same structure, anode electrolyte cathode layers. Uh, each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. So a planar system, like what some of the very large installations, uh, uh, Bloom Energy, for example, uh, produce, have a lot of thin plates, and that's that's how they come up with the name planar, stacked on top of each other. Um, it's a very nice technology because it's very easy to assemble and it's very easy to scale. The difference between one kilowatt and two kilowatt SOFT stacks that are planar is effectively uh, an extra one kilowatt block stacked on top of the first kilowatt block. One of the problems with planar systems is they're very difficult to seal. You have a very large area you have to seal. And it's also very difficult to operate in a cyclic fashion. Uh, remember, you have to go from cold to hot, zero degrees, 25 degrees Celsius, all the way up to about 1,000 degrees Celsius. And uh, uh, thermal expansion can usually provide a lot of stress in, in planar systems. For a lot of those reasons, you typically use a planar fuel cell for very large applications, greater than a kilowatt type applications, and you would typically want to run them in continuous operational modes. So a planar fuel cell is something that you might end up seeing in your house or in your neighborhood producing a whole lot of power for a group of homes. On the other hand, a tubular fuel cell um, are, are a lot of little tubes. Um, uh, the SOFC layers are added radially, like I mentioned. One of the disadvantages here is that they're fairly hard to assemble. Uh, they're also fairly hard to scale. I can't simply stack another tubular fuel cell on top of or circumferentially around the first one. I have to add them together in this sort of complex manner. Uh, one of the advantages, however, is that they're very easy to seal. It's easy to seal a tube surface to something else, and it's very easy to operate in a cyclic mode. For these reasons, tubular fuel cells are typically used in situations that are about less than 10 kilowatts and where cyclic operation is required. So that's something that you would typically see uh, fitting very nicely with uh, uh, hybridization with a PV system. Next slide. So this is actually a, a pretty good image of what USSI's uh, solid oxide fuel cells look like. These tubes uh, are about the size of a pen or a pencil. Um, We've warmed these tubes up to operational temperatures in as little as a few minutes, but typically when they're built into a system, it takes about 10 to 30 minutes to warm up and then to cool down as well. Uh, one of the other advantages that we've tried to bring to the table, um, trying to be a portable and uh, very flexible platform, is that we only use uh, a fuel and ambient air as feedstocks. Uh, some other uh, fuel cell companies or reforming technologies uh, use water as well as a feedstock. That increases your overall system efficiency, which decreases fuel consumption. However, it also provides another point of failure if you're operating in very low temperature conditions and just another system to manage. So we're very light, very flexible platform, uh, and we only use propane or natural gas plus that ambient air. So it's, it's one of the differentiating factors for our system. Next slide. So this is... Uh, our 250 watt battery tender, a P250i. Um, this is typically installed as commercial or industrial grade um, system. It automatically starts and stops uh, due to your battery bank voltage. And I guess this is probably a good time to point to the bottom of the slide here. Uh, you can see the fuel cell system, the P250i. Um, on one hand, on the left side, you've got uh, your fuel tank, your, your propane connected to the fuel cell system. On the other side, you've got your battery bank. Now, our system interfaces to the battery bank with uh, voltage sense leads and power leads. And there's also a remote temperature monitor so that we can accurately compensate um, charging voltages for the, for the battery bank. And then there's also some external communication so that you can connect to whatever other auxiliary systems you might have so that you can get more data out of the system or so, you, so that you can command the system to turn on and turn off if you've got a little bit more smarts on your, on your standalone power system. 
It's a very light system, like I said, about 25 watts. Um, and you can use either propane or natural gas on or with this system with only a software update. Next slide. So if I highlight some of the specifications, uh, you can see here several specifications you can find on our website. Um, but if we click through a couple slides, yep. So uh, the design target life of the system is about 250 cycles or 3,000 hours. Um, that is about an order of magnitude higher than a lot of other um, uh, fuel cell cycle, solid oxide fuel cell cycle uh, declarations that you see uh, nowadays. Our operating temperature uh, operates down to negative 40 C. One of our limitations here obviously is the vaporization point for propane. So operating on CNG, you can absolutely achieve negative 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, storage temperatures um, are also very low. Our system can survive very, very cold storage temperatures. Now this is not something that you would see out of a uh, direct methanol fuel cell system uh, or out of a hydrogen PEM system, both of which uh, have aqueous uh, membranes which would freeze and damage that fuel cell if you have a freeze thaw cycle. Uh, our system is also fairly quiet, um, so it's fairly hard to hear from even a few meters away. And it operates up to about 10,000 feet elevation. So again, this is a simple slide. Yep, that's fine. This is a simple slide to uh, just illustrate the ease of uh, finding fuel for this particular system. Uh, the solid oxide fuel cell, our P250i, uses about a quarter pound an hour. So again, that one standard propane tank that you typically hook up to your gas grill will be able to operate your site for about 80 hours, producing 250 watts into your battery bank. So just as an overview of that particular product, uh, this fuel cell electrochemically converts propane into natural gas, uh, propane or natural gas into electrical power. Uh, there's no moving parts except for a couple of cooling fans inside. Uh, there's no oil changes and no exercise cycles. Uh, this can be added to any existing system as well as designed into new systems. Um, so it acts separately and autonomously. If you're worried about it um, interfering with your solar charge controller, you don't have to. Um, and we also utilize voltage sense leads and this remote temperature probe so that we accurately uh, determine when to turn the fuel cell on and when to turn the fuel cell off. So just at a, again, at a really, really high level, uh, this kind of a fuel cell um, is perfect for applications that are anywhere between 50 and 500 watts of load, uh, where you typically have um, a need for a power system where your load is either too big for batteries where your runtime is constrained or it's really hard to resupply fuel or the job is too small for engines. Uh, generators are either too bulky, heavy, noisy, dirty, or just too inefficient. So that's where we typically try to operate. And uh, so again, if you need something that's uh, uh, portable, lightweight, quiet, rapidly deployable, um, something that's reasonably self-contained, this is a, a, an excellent option for you. And I think that this, so, so this slide uh, is a very good illustration of the efficiency um, comparison. And this comparison is between a PT50i and a uh, sort of a three kilowatt uh, tactical gen set and also compared to a thermoelectric generator. So thermoelectric generators are typically fairly low efficiency, two to 3%, we're about 10 times that. So you'd typically be able to save about uh, uh, 10 times the amount of fuel between a thermoelectric generator and a, and a solid oxide fuel cell system like the P250i. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn the presentation back over to Dave and he can go through a couple more case studies and finish this up. All right, thank you, Tom, that was great. All right, so I'm going to talk about another case study, which is a radio repeater station. Um, in this case, the electric load was uh, is 60 watts, um, and we've got a scenario with six 130-watt solar panels, um, 20 90-amp-hour batteries, um, and a P250i fuel cell with two 40-pound uh, uh, propane tanks. So here's just a, a summary of the, the outcome, and then I'll get a little bit more into the details that go behind it. Um, but this shows that 
this accounts for this analysis accounts for the cost of not only the fuel sort the the cost of the fuel for the various types of power sources, um, but also the cost of delivering that fuel and the cost of main, maintaining the equipment. Um, here's the assumptions. The assumptions is that a helicopter lift for fuel would be six thousand dollars per lift. Um, refueling field service labor would be about $1,400 per day. Uh, hydrogen uh, cost would be about $42 per pound, and propane cost would be about $1.65 per pound. So those are the assumptions that went into the model. The table uh, at the lower table kind of shows the total annual recurring costs. Um, in the left column, we're showing the various system types. And we'll get into the details in the next few slides, but we're showing a 100 watt tag on the first row. It's uh, because it's very inefficient. It requires two helicopter lifts of fuel annually, a total of about 480 pounds. Well, I, I actually, uh, uh, yeah, a total of 480 pounds of fuel, 840 pounds worth of uh, fuel plus cylinder to lift. Fuel costs about $800, logistics costs about $13,398, so total annual costs for just getting out there and maintaining and refueling of about $14,000. The 200 watt PEM is very similar, consumes a lot less fuel, but it's hydrogen fuel, so it's, it's more expensive, and because of the cylinder size, it still requires the two lifts, so there's about a $14,000 cost to that as well. Whereas with the solid oxide fuel cell, the annual fuel consumption is just about 73 pounds, which is it's more than the PEM in this model, um, but it's propane as opposed to hydrogen. And so the um, cost, oh well, and, and the, the, the one underlying assumption is this, whereas the hydrogen needs to be handled via the helicopter and the large amount of propane or the tag needs to be handled via helicopter, partially seasonally because it, you can't access the site on the ground during the winter and partially just for handling purposes. Um, whereas with the solid oxide fuel cell, it can be one delivery of propane, a relatively small amount in the summer months and can be handled in uh, or, or hauled in via an ATV. So the total annual recurring cost is about $1,500. So substantially more cost effective than the other two scenarios. Um, a standalone solar system in this application without the fuel cell involved would have to be about twice as large to support the load during the inclement winter months. And we'll show the details in the following slides. So this slide, there's a lot of information on here. This particular slide is showing the system with the solid oxide fuel cell. Um, the blue line is showing uh, the battery, uh, yeah, the battery state of charge, where on the uh, right-hand axis, it's showing battery state of charge from zero to 100%. And so you can see that the battery state of charge is never falling below about 50%. So battery life will be pretty good. Um, you can see the fuel consumption is the black line and it's showing tank percentage from 100% down to 0%. So it's showing about an, one annual refueling cycle. And then the yellow line is showing the, the solar power where it's high in the summer and low in the winter. And the red line is showing fuel cell power where it's negligible, it's zero in the summer and um, periodic during the winter. So again, with in this scenario, about 140 pounds of fuel per year delivered via, via ATV with a solar fuel cell hybrid system. So the fuel cell enables lowering the solar uh, system cost, reducing the size of the solar array and the battery bank, um, and while simultaneously being a high efficient device allows a relatively minimal amount of fuel delivery. This next scenario is without the solid oxide fuel cell, just six solar modules. 
Um, the blue line again showing battery voltage shows that the voltage falls below 0% from November to April. So this system fails. This small six solar panel system fails from December to May. And this slide shows 12 solar modules with no solid oxide fuel cell. The system works very marginally. Um, in January, the battery state of charge reaches 20%. That's very hard on the battery. Uh, it's particularly hard on the batteries during this challenging cold winter months. Um, and it's a very marginal function. Uh, and it's also a fairly large solar array with 12 modules. And this next slide shows um, a tag, and the issue here is the refueling. The tag will keep the batteries happy. The blue line is showing battery state of charge in excess of 40 or 50 percent annually. Um, it's showing the tag cycling during the winter. It's showing solar carrying the load during the summer. Um, but the issue is that we need to fuel the tag twice a year, and it's consuming a lot of fuel, and the logistics costs are high with two helicopter lifts. Um, PEM is operating pretty much identical to the TAG, and for that matter, identical to the solid oxide fuel cell, uh, just requiring hydrogen to be lifted via helicopter as opposed to propane being delifted, uh, delivered via ATV. So in, in summary, what we've talked about today is that uh, rugged tubular solid oxide fuel cells provide an economic value as a gap filling technology for solar battery hybrid power systems in harsh remote applications. Um, they have on off cycle capability for low fuel consumption, low growth delivered fuel weight, and are robust in cold environments. Solid oxide fuel cells provide economic value in highly distributed backup power of critical assets, where you can just set it and forget it, uh, reliability. So on, on the Sunwise site, we have additional technical resources uh, at sunwise.com. We have tech notes, we have recordings of the webinars, and we have additional engineering bulletins as well. And we're also available uh, for applications engineering to look at your uh, hybrid uh, standalone fuel cell, standalone solar, or solar fuel cell power system applications. So room for questions here. Thanks, Anybody guys. Appreciate. Yeah, oh. I, we got a few questions on the chat box that I'll read out. Um, we'll just kind of start from the top and go through them. Um, the first question that was already answered is whether or not the charging capabilities of the fuel cell are battery are temperature compensated, and the answer for that is yes, they are. And the charging profile um, can be considered similar to a solar charge controller. Um, Todd, if you want to add additional information for that, feel free to chime in. Um, but Rob did address that in the chat box. Sure. Yeah. The only thing that I'd add is that. Um, it's fairly flexible. Uh, we provide a lot of uh, user features to, to have uh, our customers uh, influence what that charge profile looks like. So if you've got something that is special and you have a special charging profile, um, uh, we're, we're, it's very easy for us to accommodate that. Perfect, good information, appreciate it. Okay, the next question um, actually comes from uh, one of our folks. Uh, the question is on the emissions profile of this uh, USSI unit and whether or not you've had any experience or information on whether or not that would be clean enough to serve for air quality sampling purposes. Have you ever um, had any applications that are you familiar with what the um, air quality requirements may be for air sampling? I imagine that may be something that's jurisdictional based. Uh, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, to answer your point directly, no, I'm not sure about uh, uh, what kind of requirements are are around for air sampling. Uh, our system does effectively combust propane, so yes, the emissions are CO2 and water. Uh, if that affects uh, or is one of the uh, uh, particles that you're measuring for, then it, it could affect that uh, that that particular measurement. Um, 
I'm happy to talk about it more offline. If you have any more questions or want to point me at any other resources, I'd be, I'd be more, more than happy to uh, interface with you a little bit more and talk about that. Perfect. Yeah, I think uh, our salesperson, David Love, might have some specific applications for that, so we can take that offline. Thank you. Um, the next question that we had was on remote uh, communications via the unit. Um, there was a question of whether the communication was available in IP. Um, I believe we answered that in that the remote communication um, platform is via RS-232. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't do IP in the future. We actually have some uh, internal development um, actively progressing along that path. Perfect. Good uh, information. Tom, Tom, do you want to mention the portal or platform that you, you guys have for monitor, your, your telemetry system? Is that relevant here? Uh, sure it is, actually. Um, so one of the devices that we uh, that we also offer as an accessory to the P250i fuel cell is uh, a telematics uh, and data logging service. Um, that's effectively a, a, an integrated micro com microcomputer that uh, interfaces through RS-232 through our unit um, and can talk to uh, either a cellular or a satellite modem to be able to uh, send out packets of information about how the fuel cell is operating and how your power system is operating. So I can remotely log into uh, an online uh, telemetry site and view all of the assets under your control effectively and see how the fuel cells are operating, how much fuel is left in the in the, in the the system, what the battery voltage is at, if there are any faults on the fuel cell, if there are any other particular events for the rest of the system. Uh, that particular unit, um, does have have sort of a TCP IP uh, connection. So it would be possible to also speak to that through TCP IP. And also, Errol, correct me if I'm wrong, but we also have a um, um, an RS-232 option on some cell modem um, communications as well, don't we, I think? Sure, yeah, yeah. There's definitely uh, cellular gateway devices that will accept RS-232 data, absolutely. All right, um, so the next question that we have is on, uh, it's actually a two-part question. The first part is the lowest power model option uh, that USSI offers. I believe that's a 250 watt unit, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. So we have pretty much one commercial unit, it's a 250 watt unit. Um, we also have uh, a more ruggedized military unit, which is about 350 watts, so it's a little bit bigger. Uh, it okay. looks like the next, sec next section of the question is what happens if my load consumes less than 50 watts? Correct, yeah, and I basically mentioned that's just going to extend the recharge cycling of the fuel cell, essentially, as long as it's paired with batteries. Yes, yeah, and and, uh, and in case I didn't mention it earlier, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of good work that should be done up front, uh, whether it's a new system or an existing system that you're adding on to, uh, to try and decide the right operational conditions for the fuel cell to interface with your battery size and your PV size or whatever whatever other uh, uh, input uh, power systems you have to that particular hybrid system to maximize the fuel cell life cycle. And that's, some, that, that, that's a service that we're happy to provide and we provide to pretty much every customer that comes to knock on our door. And we've got, a, just to chime in there, Sunwise has a pretty good model now as well for simulating that with regards to the number of cycles and uh, fuel consumption based upon the area it's in and the uh, the load uh, along with the battery size and the uh, solar race. We've got a pretty good simulating model for that as well now. So, so Tom, in the case of the USSI fuel cell, um, I think if, if there's batteries in the system, the batteries are carrying the load anyway. So if the load is sub 50 watts and the battery, or, or just it, just speaking specifically to the question 50 watts, but really if the battery uh, state of charge is uh, high, if the batteries are in good shape, good state, high state of charge, the fuel cell will essentially stand by. Is that correct? It, it just won't uh, charge the batteries? Yes, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And so our case of optimizing fuel cell life is just deciding or trying to design the hybrid system so that we don't do a, a too many cold hot cycles of the fuel stack. Is that 
Right. That's yeah. That's right. If I have a very low load for some particular application, I might have already designed the battery system to go along with it to be a very small amp hour battery, and a very small amp hour battery would charge very quickly with 250 watt input, which would lead to a lot of short cycles on the fuel cell. So what we're trying to do is just to maximize uh, uh, or optimize that that fuel cell runtime. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, Tom, it looks like um, you're able to read uh, these question boxes directly. The next part um, has several components to it regarding kind of how the fuel cell winds down its life cycle, what um, the end replacement is, whether it's a core unit or a full unit, and whether that failure mode is a gradual decrease in efficiency and output, or whether it's typically a sort of um, like a, uh, an immediate failure mode, for instance. Right, yeah, you're right. That is a great question with a lot of different components. Um, at the end of life, um, the P250i, as it is now, can be returned for repair. Um, we offer that uh, once it's in, well, once it's in the facility, uh, we'll evaluate exactly what failed. Typically, it is the, uh, the fuel cell stack or the, the, the bunch of tubes put together. Uh, that can be replaced and the unit can be uh, recalibrated, reconfigured, uh, and sent back out the door back to the customer. Um, that's something that maybe in the future uh, you, the customer can do themselves, but for now it's something that we typically want to do uh, in our facility. Um, the next section of the question, how does the system degrade over life? Is it, so, is it sudden failure or is it an efficiency degradation? The answer is that it's an efficiency uh, or output power degradation over time. Uh, we don't see sudden failures of our unit, which you'll typically see is 250 watt output for a very long period of time. And at the end of life, that starts to degrade and maybe you lose uh, five or 10 watts per cycle or per couple hundred hours until it hits effectively zero watts output. Okay, um, we, the next question is um, from Chris, and this was, um, this was more pointed for uh, Rob and Dave, whether or not an ROI analysis was performed on the standalone system with the 60 watt telecom site. Um, that may be something that we can uh, take offline and address directly if there's not a quick answer to that. Yeah, um, I, I'm not positive of that, and we may need to take that offline. We've done several ROI analysis. Um, we've, we've performed ROI analysis for several different systems, but I don't have it handy specifically for this system. That's my best way of answering well, that. We, that's fine. We can get directly with Chris, Rob, and we can hash that out with him. All right, the next question uh, is on heat production from the unit um, and whether or not um, there's fuel being burned as part of that. Second part, how is there no pollution? I think we addressed this in the presentation that there actually is some amount of pollution out of this unit. I think it's a 0 0.75 kilogram or pounds um, was the unit, um, but I'll let you speak to that exactly. Um, I believe from speaking to Dave, he said that most of the heat management happens internally so that overall from the outside, the unit runs relatively cool. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. So although the internal temperatures, the operational temperatures are about 800 degrees Celsius for our particular unit, um, the if I was to take off this case, the hottest surface I could touch would probably be about uh, 100 degrees Celsius. Our exhaust coming out is about 150 degrees inside of the case, but we have some thermal management uh, so that once the exhaust air leaves our system boundary, the hottest temperature you'll, you'll ever see is about uh, 70 degrees Celsius. And all of that air is ducted out through the exhaust and in a typical installation is vented through uh, 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 two or uh, four inch exhaust duct, round exhaust duct, uh, out to the ambient environment. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, the next question is on whether there's any proprietary software required for the remote communication with uh, the fuel cell. Um, I, I would imagine that sort of, is that 
software available to download for free off your website or something that would be set up um, during the purchase process of the fuel cell unit itself. Right, it would be set up during the purchase process of the unit. Okay. Um, next question. In interest of viability of rest of the system, West Africa, um, extreme high temperatures, I think we said up to 50 C. Um, Rob, in your experience, is 50 C reasonable for a lot of these high temperature applications in places like Africa and the Middle East? I think that's uh, probably... definitely, def yeah, definitely in the Middle East and parts of, say, Northern Africa across the Sahara, you can easily get up to uh, 55, and even 60 C. Um, it mm -hmm. is possible in the dead of the summer. Uh, the thing about that, though, is, is that generally when that happens, is also when you have the maximum amount of sunlight. Uh, yeah, it's so typically it's, not being utilized, right? And exactly. so for the storage temperatures up to 71C, as long as we were in an idle mode and we could design the system so that expected runtime was not in the hottest months, um, I would think that 71 storage temperature would generally be acceptable, especially if the core unit was shaded in some fashion from the PV array, for instance. Yeah, it's, uh, Tom, what, what, um, just out of curiosity, what, why is the limit at 50C? What happens if you go above that? Is there a problem with the electronics? Or, I mean, obviously the, the stack itself is running at 1,000, so I don't think that the uh, 10 extra degrees C is going to make a difference there. Right, right. Um, no, typically our, our limitations, particularly uh, flow sensing electronics, uh, our model that we're actually uh, gearing up to produce right now um, should have an increased operational and storage temperature limit. Um, we're still in the validation processes of what that limit really is, but the target is uh, 70C operating temperature with a higher storage temperature. I'm not sure what it would be at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Yep, that's great. Um, next question is on max voltage we're able to obtain. Uh, it looks like here, 1224, the nominal voltage options on this unit. Um, are we looking at the typical plus minus 10% of nominal battery bank voltage um, as the upper limits, or do you guys have a specific number for that? Right, so this unit that I'm talking about here in this presentation um, is 10 to 33 volts output power, output voltage. Uh, if you were to purchase a unit today, the unit that you would see would have increased operational voltage ranges from 8 volts um, on the lower limit up to 60 volts output for the 48 volt uh, nominal DC banks. Thank you. Um, the next question, I guess I actually have to correct myself, um, is on the nominal voltage. Well, it's a two-part question. One, on external power uh, consumption. I believe you said the fuel cell unit does consume a relatively small amount of power during some of the cycle startups and shutdowns. Maybe you can speak to what that power requirement actually is. And then I guess um, on the current side, it says 12, 24 volts DC, but there is a 48 volt DC version as well. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, the, uh, our, our unit that uh, we're producing right now um, is one generation better than this unit um, that is uh, able to do 12 volt all the way up to 48 volt nominal um, battery voltages. And to address that earlier question during, uh, during startup, which is typically about a 25 minute process, uh, the system will consume about 25 to 35 watts of power. And during the cool down process, which is typically about a 20 to 25 minute process, the system will consume uh, another 20 to 30 watts of power. Perfect, thank you. All right, well, those were all the entered questions that I had in the chat box. I usually like to give people another last 30 seconds or so in case anybody's on the fence or hasn't had a chance to get their question in. So we just want to give people a couple more moments if they have any last minute questions. Um, but otherwise, you've had great answers so far and all that. I really appreciate that. A uh, quick reminder, this will, this recording of this webinar will be posted on our website. Um, we will include the link in the follow-up email that all the registered attendees will get. Um, and you can also find it on our website. 
um, under our webinars page on the learning dropdown. Uh, the link was provided in the last slide that we briefly touched on as well, uh, which you can find in the recording. Okay, well, I don't think there's any more questions. So Tom, uh, David, Rob, thank you guys all very much for putting this together and thank you everybody who attended and hopefully we'll see folks on our next webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.